That was it. Thank you. So I'm glad to see a little bit more people than earlier because if there were less people I was going to like suggest to turn on the sauna heater and just have a better party just with those who are here. But since we got some people here, let's start. So my name is Alexander Zinchuk. I work as software architect for TopTal, which is an outsource company. And I also an executive engineer in my own small company called Anyway Labs. And today I want to uh, talk about specification driven development. Let's start with the question, what is a specification? Uh, usually it's a, or not usually, but always, it's a document that fully describes your API. Uh, it has a list, it has a list of all the possible endpoints that your API has, and it describes all the data structures that are used within that API. Um, yeah, and uh, usually it, it's used for generating documentation. This is how it happens today. So most people uh, just maintain that specification for the only case, for the only reason, is just to generate a documentation and publish it somewhere in web, uh, as a web page, for example, or as a PDF document, no matter, for someone who consumes the API can get to know it, can figure out what they can use, uh, how they can use it, and so on. Uh, but this is not the only possible value that your specification may provide. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about that. But before that, um, let's talk about Open API. This is kind of industry standard for uh, describing APIs in form of a specification. There are different ones as well, but I would say that this one is mostly well known. Um, anybody, by the way, who is developer here and who uses uh, Open API format for their specification? Okay, we got, oh, we got a lot of people here. Cool. Very, very good. So uh, then you maybe know that OpenAPI is a new name for uh, the previous Swagger specification. Um, it was a project called Swagger, then it was given away to the open source community and renamed it to OpenAPI. And since version three, we call it OpenAPI, but for the version two, we still call it Swagger. And also Swagger is a, now it's a set of tools uh, for developers, so for example, for uh, web interface for creating specifications, for testing, uh, and so on. So here is an example of OpenAPI. It is a JSON file. It may, uh, might be YAML as well, but it contains of, uh, consists of three parts. First one is header, which has main information, like title, description, version of your API, and possibly some technical details. The second part is uh, the list of endpoints, which is called paths in Swagger uh, version 2. And the third part is the list of data structures. So what's the problem with maintaining open API? The problem is it's extremely verbose and sometimes it's boring and annoying to keep it up to date because if you do that manually, it really uh, fast, like, uh, fastly becomes very complicated because uh, as I said, it's very verbose. You have to write a lot of uh, parts, a lot of JSON or YAML code. So mostly people don't want to do that. And uh, quite quickly, they uh, just leave maintaining specification and don't do that anymore. But for those who does, uh, there are different attempts to optimize this process. For example, you can try to split your specification in multiple files. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit easier, but still as your uh, specification grows, it's getting harder. Uh, other ways to use JSDoc, to put your specification right into your code in form of comments. But the same problem here is it grows, your project grows, and it's hard to figure out where is your code, where is comments, the file with uh, code just gets bigger, and so on. Another approach is online editors and services. There are many different ones, uh, they provide different features, but uh, for me specifically, uh, they were not very useful because they have a set of limitations because each service provide, um, provide its own set of possible features and you are limited with this, uh, within that set. 
And also, a very important thing is uh, I'm going to be saying about how you can reuse your specification in code. So for that, you need to get your specification back. So for services, you will need to literally download the JSON or YAML to reuse it in your code. So it's not the way that we want to use here. Um, there is one more approach, and I want to be sharing the examples in this presentation of my own project called Tiny Spec. Uh, this is a uh, human readable syntax for OpenAPI. It's an alter uh, alternative to OpenAPI. So it allows you to describe your models and your endpoints uh, in the small and easy to maintain files. It is, oh, uh, yeah, before that, an example. So uh, let's imagine that we need to get uh, users. We need to write an endpoint that will return a collection of users. Uh, so what do we do here with TinySpec? First of all, we will describe the model. Uh, this is the first tiny spec file that you will have, uh, and it, it ends on .models.tinyspec, and it consists of one model, uh, which is called user, and it has three properties. The first one is name, which is by default string. The second one is age, and it's uh, an integer, and you can both you can use both uh, full word integer here to specify type or just the first letter i. And note that. Um, question mark, which means that the value is, the property is optional, so it may exist or may not exist. And the third property determines if user is, not, is, that, is admin or not, and it's basically a boolean value. And that's it, this is all you need for describing your user model. Now we want to describe an endpoint that will return a user. It's another type of tiny spec files, which end on .endpoints.tinyspec. And it has two, at least two uh, lines for every endpoint. The first one uh, determines the HTTP verb, which is in this case get, and the path name, which is users. And the second line uh, is a description of uh, the response of this endpoint. So it's basically a, a key users that contains a, an array of user models. So simply like that. So. Uh, TinySpec is an NPM module, so what you will do, you, feel, you, you first will download it from NPM, install it in your system, and you will get a common line interface for that. It only has one common TinySpec, which will generate uh, a real JSON file. So here you can see we only had three lines of code, and with one common TinySpec, we get a J op full, uh, open uh, API JSON file, which has 57 lines of code. So it's impressive how much of redundant information it has, and how much of useful information uh, it has as well. So, yeah. Uh, when you have another way to, des to describe your models, it becomes a bit easier. Um, I want to mention also that um, TinySpec is in love with the JSON API, which is a website that provides specification for, um, for writing um, JSON APIs. It's basically a set of conventions of how you can name and format your uh, endpoints, data structures, and so on. And TimeSpec attempts to cover most of possible API configurations. So, back to the main idea that we had. How are we going to reuse the specification in code? So, let me start with the first example, the unit test. What's cool about writing unit tests for REST API? You can consider your endpoints as units for your uh, project. That's why you can write unit tests not for single, uh, let's say, models or classes or rows uh, or controllers, but, the but for the whole endpoints. Because you can consider an endpoint as a unit in your project. So how would you do that? Uh, you can emulate an HTTP request in your unit test and then check the response. For that, different uh, modules and different libraries exist. In this talk, I'll be sharing examples of uh, not JS, NPM, and Ruby, but you can keep in mind that you can use these approaches for almost any kind of technology stack, no matter if it's Java, PHP, Python, everything else. Uh, almost everywhere you will find those uh, modules that will do this just the same. So here is how these testing frameworks uh, work. So here uh, you can see that we emulate a, re a GET request to user standpoint, and then we check the response. So how do we do that? We know that we have uh, a response and we can check each value in the response uh, one by one. We can try to figure out if they match the expected type. You can see this just the same code on JavaScript and uh, all the same on Ruby with another Ruby gem for that. Um, 
But now let's go back to the previous picture that we had and take a bit closer look to what we actually have in OpenAPI JSON. This part uh, where we describe our user, mo user model is uh, another format which is called JSON schema. It's a very powerful format that allows you to check and to, first to describe any kind of object uh, to set all the properties and types that it has. So how we can reuse that? Um, for that we can use even more modules that will allow us to test the response against the schema that we'll have in our spec. So, here is how we change our example. Now we will require our open, J, uh, open API JSON file that we, that we had before, writing your in our test. And then we can have a, an object that contains all the schemas that we described before. And then we can pass that schemas to, uh, to the function or methods that we now, ha not, now have, because we installed those plugins. Uh, so we don't need to repeat ourselves, describing every type again when we test the API because we already uh, written a specification for that. So now what we do, we simply test against that specification. So it will reduce a lot of code, a lot of boilerplate um, code that you otherwise would have to write. So this was just the first example of unit testing. Um, there is some more. Uh, now we are going. We are going to talk about user data validation. So uh, it shouldn't be mentioned how important this validation in case you want to create a secure API because the data that comes from user is very important and it will it, it may um, affect your database or some another third services that you pass it within your endpoint. So we always have to validate what comes from user. It's obvious. So how we will do that? Another example, uh, we used to have a user model, but now let's imagine that we want to update the user in our database. We don't want to use the same model because we want to change rules of how user can update. For that, we will introduce another model uh, called user update. First, we will remove the third property is admin because um, we don't want to let anybody change if user is admin or not. It's not secure, so we're simply removing that field. Also, please note those uh, question marks after each field because right now we can, um, well, uh, this is what user will send in, body of, in the body of a request. So we want to let users provide uh, any of those fields. So we can let update only name, for example, or only age, or all of them. That's why now they are optional. Also note that uh, exclamation mark, which means that the set of properties is now strictly defined. So we don't want to let anybody add some other fields that we are not expect. This is for security as well. And now we will uh, write the endpoint again. Now the verb is patch. Now we specify users with an ID. And we pass in body a user that represents the user update model. And as a response, we will expect a simple Boolean value uh, in the key success. So here is what happens when we generate OpenAPI. Uh, and here are modules that we can use in validation to leverage schemas that we have just generated. So here is how it works. This, this is an example of uh, uh, Node.js road. Uh, and what we have here, first we get the data from a request body, and then we pass that data to the validate function along with the schema that we just required before from the open JSON, open API JSON file. So in this case, uh, if the data doesn't match the schema, the specification, what we expect, the error will, will be generated and home. And what we can do here, we can catch this error, and we can even format it properly and rethrow uh, re it uh, in this way that we expect. So we will describe an error as well uh, and add it to our specification. We will describe parameters of each error. And we will include it in the, as one more possible response of our endpoint. And this is very useful because first we can start writing unit tests that will check invalid situations also. Not only valid code behavior, but also we can check the uh, possible errors and if error is generated properly. Because it's important since your uh, API consumers rely on your errors, for example, because they want to show pop-up windows uh, in that interface uh, with the correct error message and so on. So we want to describe errors as well. And this is very useful with this approach. Um, going further, this is model serialization. So 
almost any backend framework now uses our RAM approach. Uh, it is very common. So what is that? It's, a repre it's representing um, database table as a class uh, in uh, in language. But what we do after that, we will return the data to user, and this is this is called JSON view. And the process is called spheralization. It's a process of uh, formatting um, data into uh, something we want to show to users. Um, we will specify the list of properties that we want to show because we don't want show uh, we don't want to return all the properties because they were they might be something um, important. For example, passwords or something else, some system information that we don't want to uh, um, let users to see. So. And for almost every um, framework, the different serializer plugins exist, but as the uh, project grows, uh, you have more and more associated models. You have more and more different endpoints that can uh, return the same model, but with different JSON views. Uh, so you will have to describe all of that in serializations. But you know, you don't, you not only do that in serializations, but you also do that when you query, query database. For example, you specify which associated models you want to include, and then you want to specify just the same way when you serialize model, but actually you already you have already done it in your specification. And um, specification has all the needed information. Let's check how it works. Now, an even more uh, complicated example. Let's imagine that we have a block engine, and we want to uh, get all users with all the posts, with all the comments to this uh, post. So we have four, uh, three simple models, which is common, post, and user. And you can notice that post already has comments uh, associated to it. And now we have a new model, user with post, that extends user and add an additional property, post, which can, uh, contains an array of posts. Um, we also have a simple endpoint that will return users with the new model. And now we have we see that generated open API JSON is even bigger, and it's getting bigger and bigger always. Um, but how we will serialize that? For that, another module exists, which is called uh, which is called SQLize serialize. There is a um, there is a, a ORM uh, engine for Node.js called SQLize. So this is plugin for SQLize. So how it works? First, you query database using the SQLize uh, query language, and then all you need to do is just simply pass the SQLize result along with the schema to a method that is exported from SQLize to Realize, and all the rest is done magically. So, no more describing which fields you need, no more describing associations and any, anything else. It's already in your spec, so it should work like that. Okay, perfect. It's time to magic. Um, number four, static typing. It's for tough guys. <laughs> Is there anybody who uses uh, static typing, TypeScript, or Flow? Okay, great. Cool, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, so, yeah, and you may guess uh, that you can use, you can generate static types out of spec as well, obviously. Uh, for that, you will use JSON schema that uh, is Right in, right in your open API. For that, some modules, uh, this is, sorry, uh, an example for NPM, but you can find it for Java as well, I'm pretty sure about it. <laughs> for uh, TypeScript and for Flow, so how it works, you just need another step in your process. Now, after you have an open API, you will pass it to a, another command line, uh, to another command that will generate uh, TypeScript uh, description. So you can remember what we had before, and this is just automatically, just automatically generated from it. So all the same types, you can right now use it in your code. For example, in the same row, you can now add typings for uh, user input data and for your serialized data as well, which will um, obviously provide you benefits of static typing, like how to completing and all that stuff. Um, is another bonus example of how you can use static typing in your tests. For example, to make sure that you provide correct data to tests, 
to avoid possible false positives uh, when you write your test uh, incorrectly. So, yeah. And uh, just the last thing is typecasting. Sometimes you get your body not in the proper JSON format. For example, if you work with the GET request or if your API doesn't consume application JSON, mind type, you will get uh, these kind of parameters and it will result into uh, this object where all your properties are strings. And if you already added the validation function, it will obviously fail because it will expect different types. So you need to cast values before you can validate them. You can guess what exists for that? It's another NPM module. So simply passing uh, your query along with the schema that you imported from open API JSON file, you will get a properly uh, formatted object with all the needed types. And right after that, you can use validate function. So this is basically it. Uh, I can say that I've been using these approaches for quite a long time, for a couple of years. And this, is, this becomes very, very useful when you get to know it, when you um, have a behavior of writing APIs like that. It saves you a lot of time and a lot of boilerplate code that you could write instead. So um, also about tiny spec, obviously um, anything that I told is not related, not um, dependent on tiny spec because if you have other ways to describe open API JSON, you can use all the same approaches. But anyways, if you like tiny spec, uh, I'll be glad if you check the GitHub page, maybe add some um, feature or even pull requests. Uh, that would be very cool. So anyways, thank you very much for listening. It was really great to talk here. So thanks again. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.